Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social TV magazine on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm hosting this week's program, I forgot the word, with my fantastic co-host Bahram Suruj Hello. and Fariwars Puya. Hello. In this week's program, we're going to be speaking about the abysmal situation in Iraq and the establishment of a Khalifa by the brutal ISIS. We'll be interviewing an Iraqi Kurdish women's rights campaigner, Hozan Mahmoud, about the situation there. Before we go into our program, though, we've got a poster behind us because we are campaigning for the freedom of several jailed workers, labor activists in Iran, uh, particularly those of Reza Shahabi and Behram Ebrahim Zadeh. Uh, there's a campaign going on now for uh, their safety and for their freedom, particularly given health um, uh, concerns that we have about them. So do support this campaign. Before we go into our program, though, let's listen to a brief clip about the background in Iraq. Stay with us. ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has appeared in a mosque in the city of Mosul, which has been seized along with areas of western Iraq and northern Syria by the group. Al-Baghdadi, dressed in long black robes and wearing a Rolex watch, has delivered a sermon announcing that he will henceforth be known as the Khalif Ibrahim, Emir of the Faithful in the Islamic State. ISIS has brought with it a rise in rapes, mass executions, and the imposition of Sharia law, forcing countless people to flee areas under its control. The group, which has reportedly $2 billion in assets and 10,000 jihadis, is now called IS, or Islamic State. Now, the Khalifa is uh, every Islamist's wet dream and everybody else's nightmare, and I think with you know, what, what we're seeing with ISIS in Iraq, I mean, seriously, whenever I think that I can't see any more barbarity and brutality from the Islamists, there's something more and, and, and more unbelievable. And I think ISIS has just shown the level of brutality, the level of inhumanity of, of this, this movement. And with it, it just brings terror and, you know, mass executions and, of course, the dreaded Sharia law. I think what, what we see is that in a very short period of time, transformation of a criminal gang, uh, who's actually used the situation and, to, and, and uh, um, established themselves as a state. So a criminal to Islamic state criminal. We could see what happens in a very short period, period of time with no inhibitions and there is no excuse, there is nothing. This situation actually happens in many countries. Exactly the same situation happened in Iran within a slightly different context. A bunch of criminals took over and they started massacring a lot of political prisoners um, and a lot of opposition groups. Um, and exactly the same thing happened. And you could see other groups in Iraq, you know, in, in, in the last sort of decade, we've seen how they've actually functioned in southern part of Iraq, the one backed by the Islamic regime. They've actually had parts of uh, Iraq have taken over doing exactly the same thing. So so uh, uh, this is a, a different version. Of course, there is a, a, a political fight, there's regional powers involved in this. But at the same time, the fundamentals and essence of this is transformation of a criminal gang establishing itself in power. So I think the, the fact that they uh, made uh, such uh, quick advances um, was not only due to, to that group's um, strength, but it was partly due to the fact that they um, uh, some sections of remnants of the uh, Ba'athist regime, you know, uh, the previous one uh, under Saddam Hussein, who were dissatisfied with the central government, uh, with the Maliki government, uh, aided actually Daesh and uh, the other name for it, ISIS, Daesh is in the Arabic. And uh, the situation in Syria obviously helped and the fact that uh, Iraq um, uh, never after the war so uh, uh, sort of uh, a stable situation and, and the tensions and the space that was given to these uh, tribal groups to uh, maneuver that continued and allowed for a vacuum to be created for such forces to step in. Whether they can hold on to an Islamic state, a sort of proto-state, uh, that is still in doubt uh, because their characteristics is more like a, a force that comes and ruins. They're more like a destructive force. Whether they can hang on to it, it depends on the power balance, how much support they're going to have and what resistance is going to be mounted against them, I think. You know. 
Yeah, I mean, a lot of, uh, in, in a lot of the media coverage that you see about the situation, uh, it's often blamed on Maliki and the Iraqi government um, and the fact that it's basically divided up Iraq into various ethnicities and religious groups. But that's, that was part of the U.S. foreign policy, in a sense. It's what we were calling the Iraqization of Iraq and the world, you know, yeah, dividing Paul, it up into various groups. Paul Bremer, when you started, uh, when actually took over as the governor of uh, Iraq, um, effectively uh, called on all the ethnic and religious groups and formed the government based on that. It didn't actually start, destroy the Iraqi fundamentals of the Iraqi state, but what instilled and brought to uh, power was various criminal groups, effectively, who were organized. They could, there were no civil society, you know, all the fundamental civil society uh, and citizenry, you know, wasn't accepted as a, as a basis of a uh, state, but rather crim crim criminals, ethnic and religious groups were accepted as groups. And the most backward element of those formed the Iraqi parliament and the state. And that's the result of, uh, actually, direct result of the U.S. military occupation in Iraq. Um, and that's what, uh, you know, that, that's exactly the same thing that happened in Afghanistan as well, if you remember. You, following any military intervention by the United States, you'll have religious and ethnic groups. Citizenry does not have um, uh, a place in, in, in the greater scheme of things. And that's the unfortunate and sad situation. Now we, we're reaping the result of that. Yeah, and the fact is that, uh, I mean, if left to, to the... Uh, uh, in fighting between these forces, um, uh, Iraq could be on the way to be divided and uh, to have these uh, regions. But that's a very complex situation. You don't have one area dominated by what they call, you know, Sunni attributed uh, sections or Shia. It's very complex, especially Baghdad. Um, and but that could be a recipe for disaster. You know that uh, Yugoslavia would look like a. Uh, you know, sort of uh, peaceful day, you know, compared to what can happen in, in Iraq. But um, uh, uh, as Faribol says, the uh, seeds of the problem were planted when the, um, after the attack on Iraq, the principle of the state that was the puppet regime that was formed there was on the basis of not as citizens, but as these uh, tribal groups and uh, various sects of uh, religion and various nationalities and ethnicities, which wasn't that prominent, even under the dictatorship of Saddam. And um, so uh, they are reaping you know, the uh, results of that uh, tension and uh, sort of divisions that they created. I, I think uh, uh, Hosan Mahmoud, in the interview that we do with her, she refers to this fact that you know, citizenship doesn't have any meaning in, in Iraq any longer. And we're seeing that in other countries as well, for example, in Britain as well, the division of communities to various ethnic and religious groups. Let's go now and watch the interview with Hosan Mahmoud, and then we'll be back to discuss this matter further. Stay with us. Hello, Hosan Mahmoud. Welcome to our program. Thank you so much, Maria. I wanted to talk to you about the recent attacks of ISIS on Iraq. Uh, obviously, what we've been hearing a lot of is how they're targeting women, restricting women's rights. Tell us a bit about the situation there. We've heard about an increase in rapes and sexual jihad. Yes, certainly. Of course, in any conflict situations, what we heard about as the first uh, news is the attacks uh, on women and restricting their movements as well as rape. Uh, well, these are not new of uh, such jihadist movements or groups who are heavily armed and who are extremely primitive, in my opinion, who have no respect for human rights, for women's rights. And according to the news that comes out from Iraq, of course, um, that I haven't been there myself, but. Uh, according to the news that comes out from everywhere, from Kurdistan, from Iraq, and in the international media, we hear a lot of these stories being reported. Uh, on top of it, that they go to houses and to families if they have young girls or children, in my opinion. Uh, they marry them off to the jihadis, as they call it, uh, nikah, uh, jihadist nikah, which is 
is just basically um, child abuse, in my opinion, and it's absolutely against children's rights and human rights. Well, these are just some of the stories that we hear about, but we actually hear about other stories that they uh, carry out lots of killings and public executions and, and public killings and mass killings as well. Um, and they, they carry out terror at all levels, in my opinion, and that is really um, dangerous. I mean, I think in situations like this, it's actually quite easy to see how they're so much in conflict with the general population in the sense that uh, later on, oftentimes we're told that people want Islamists and they like Sharia rules, but here you see masses of people fleeing and how very much so the sort of Islamist values and their brutality is so much at odds with the local population. Thousands of people from the day one of the attacks, they fled to Kurdistan. You know, uh, Kurdistan is full of uh, refugees from the south part of Iraq, particularly from Mosul and the surrounding areas and they are seeking refuge in our areas because it's actually the only place that is safe for them. Uh, so if they were happy with these groups, why would they leave? On the other hand, there were news that uh, the people in the city, they welcomed them, some people, and that goes back to the treatment uh, by Maliki government of people in Mosul, um, apparently, I mean, according to to what is officially said in Iraq, that this is a majority Sunni uh, city. I mean, that goes back to that really wrong politics where human beings are reduced to religious beings, sects of religions, for example, Sunni, Shia. Uh, people in Iraq are no longer citizens. You are either Sunni, Shia, Turkmen, Kurd, or Arab, or even Arab doesn't have much more meaning anymore, in my opinion, because they are divided between Sunnis and Shias. In my opinion, ISIS doesn't really represent Sunni population. I mean, if we call it Sunni population. I myself, I don't think religion is something that people should identify with. But let's say that people call themselves Sunnis, but I don't think ISIS uh, is a representative of, of the Sunni population in Iraq. And let's make a very big distinction between politicized Islam, politicized religion, and the actual faith where people are praying or fasting and they don't actually want to politicize it. It's a personal matter. So there's a huge gap between that wrong politicized representation and between what actually religion as we know it in society where most of our families and my mom and your mom and other people who might have uh, practiced religion and they never wanted to see groups like ISIS or Al-Qaeda or, or anybody like that to actually represent them and speak on their behalf and kill on their behalf. So I think this is the, the reality and that's where the story is lost, that ISIS is nobody's representative. I think you make a really good point about the whole, the fact that there are no longer citizens at all in Iraq and, and in many countries actually. And I mean, part of the problem is the sort, sort of ethnicization and religionization of Iraq. And some of it, at least a large part of it, has to do with how it was made into being after the US attack. How, how much of a role do you think that attack has played on the situation that we're, we're seeing today? Certainly it has a lot to do with U.S. invasion of Afghanistan previously and later on on Iraq and whereby these various political Islamic groups were created or supported or backed against the other. So there has been um, a Western or an imperialist uh, hand behind that, whereas also, there is a history to this, you know, the ancient feud or, or conflict between Sunni and Shia that has always been there. For example, uh, that's this story of the Shiites and Sunnis that they never meet and they always kind of oppose each other. And let's not forget that Islam was never secularized in our countries and it was like never pushed back into where it belongs really. And that most governments, even from the Ottoman Empire where it had all these uh, places over its rule, or the Persian Empire before, or many other empires before, they had some sort of religion of their own or, 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 or endorsed Islam and they ca had some sort of Sharia law in place. But after the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the remapping of this so-called Middle East and that the division of Kurdistan into four pieces, one to Iran, Iraq, Turkey and Syria, we see a lot of trouble there. For example, let's say Kurds are known to be Sunnis, but we have never had a fundamentalist, for example, religious 
uh, movement in our country. There were some political Islamic groups, but actually, because there's elections now, this time they got very low votes. So actually, Kurdish society, in my opinion, has always been secular in, some, in one way or another. It had never condoned fundamentalist or, you know, the kind of Islamist that we know. Whereas in the South, even during Saddam's regime, there were uh, political Islamic groups, but they were highly oppressed by Saddam's regime, and they were really highly, um, uh, you know, uh, they were they were controlled, uh, so they could never gain momentum and popularity. But under the after the invasion, they unleashed. They were they come out of everywhere from Iran, from Europe. They came back. They created a ground for themselves. This is they kind of like political merchants or warlords. Actually, they are playing on the feelings of these people. Oh, Sunnis, you have oppressed Saddam was Sunni, and he has oppressed the Shiites. Now Shiites mobilize and rally people behind them. Well, Saddam was, you know, symbolizing Sunnis and, and or Shiites. So you see, there's a lot of these Shia Sunni problems, and there's a lot of political parties who are in power and outside power who are actually playing on that ground, and that's mean, where the problem is. I mean, part, partly uh, we've had well situations where Sunnis and Shias, as you say, there there could be so many different viewpoints in these groups. Uh, who are living side by side peacefully and a lot of it has to do also with it being used as a way of bringing these sort of reactionary groups to power to some extent. Um, I mean we spoke about the situation of women there and um, you know obviously when it comes to a lot of our societies um, women are not just victims they're very active in resisting and defending basic uh, rights. And I think OFI, the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, which you work with, is, has been quite instrumental in defending women's rights there. Tell us some of the things that have, you've been doing on the ground. I've, I heard that you're even doing work in areas that are under ISIS control. Yes, I'm an activist of Organization of Women's Freedom of Iraq. From the very beginning, um, from 2003 until now, they have been providing shelters for battered women uh, and, uh, you know, uncovering all kinds of crimes and violence against women in Iraq really were at some point they were risking their lives to get this information out on the rapes and tortures in prison and the Maliki regime to the uh, killings by the US and to the use, using of chemical weapons whereby a lot of children of Iraq have been um, ill and also to the recent situation whereby a lot of women are running away from the Islamic attacks and they come to the southern cities as well as to Kurdistan as well. So Ofi tries within its limits um, to basically support these women as much as they can. They go to some of the camps to provide basic necessities to women and children particularly and try to document some of the violations as well and to get some news out. Um, on what actually goes on on the ground. I mean, what, what do you think? I guess sometimes when people look at the situation, they think it's quite hopeless sometimes, you do feel. But there are obviously, there are solutions or things that you, you would like to see. I mean, very often the solutions we hear are those that the US or the Iranian regime give, which are actually, they're part of the problem in, in a lot of instances. What, what do you think is some sort of solution to the situation? I think, you know, the US and UK, specifically speaking, have had a very um, negative role on the Middle East for a very long time and specifically from 2003 onwards. Um, you know, they have created this puppet regime in Baghdad, a regime that is made up of ethno-sectarian groups whereby actually nobody agrees with the other and nobody talks to the, each other and there are almost fights between the fractures fractions between the parliamentary groups uh, because they are Sunni or they are Shia or they are Kurd or, so they don't agree on anything and corruption is widespread political violence Maliki has his own prisons torturing people other groups have their own paramilitary killing and kidnapping so it's it's a situation in my opinion it's a zone of terror and nobody know why and who and who is behind all of this Iran had a have a very a negative role in Turkey, the same thing. There's oil in Kurdistan. They are, they have a very big eye on that, and they are actually benefiting from it. Iran, the same. Uh, and on the question of independence for Kurdistan, of course, I can say the majority of Kurdish people wants independence because. Do you think independence is a possible 
solution now? I think it has to be a possible solution. I mean, because Kurdish people or the political groups, at least, they were the one who helped to create Iraq again after 2003. Uh, and then, but it doesn't work because this government has to fall, in my opinion, and it has to collapse. A government that is based on the concept of ethno sectarianism and religious sects and all these conflicts, and the people are ignored or they are made to fight against each other, then, in my opinion, such a country should be <laughs> cut into pieces, not only uh, kept by force together. If people do not uh, if people can no longer tolerate each other and can no longer live because this is Sunni or Kurd or this. I mean, the K Kurdish question is a very different question from the Sunni Shia issue. And it's a much we don't more have, historical. It's a much more historical yeah. and it's the legitimate right of people to actually have a say about their own future. I'm Kurdish, of course, and I'm leftist internationalist. I don't like borders whatsoever, and I don't think they have helped humanity at all. We are all made enemies of each other just because you are Iranian, this is Iraqi, this is Kurdish. And now we are being reduced to religious sects and within religions to something else. I mean, this all neoliberal postmodernist as well, creation of so many various identities, it has actually led humanity to, to to a very tragic situation where no longer we can even talk within the same religion. I mean, Sunni Shia, so what the hell is that? It is part of the same religion, so just each of you go to your own mosque. Now this one wants to blow up that one's mosque. You know, it, it is just crazy where the human beings are, are going in this day and age. In 21st century, whereby humanity so social movements, political movements, have gained a lot in terms of human rights, children's rights, women's rights. This is not 19th century, whereby it's the beginning of this concept. Actually, we are in 21st century, but we are actually going back to the ancient times, whereby tribes are killing each other. And it's actually what I see in Iraq. It's, it's a kind of ancient uh, conflict coming back to the fore, but in a different context and a different format. And for the Kurdish question, it's absolutely a different question. And I personally support independent Kurdish state and that it is a legitimate right of Kurdish people to say that. And it's nobody's, well, not my right and nobody's right to impose, to say get independent or not get it. It is the right of four or five million people, particularly in uh, Iraqi Kurdistan, but of course all other parts as well. In Syria, Kurds have been denied of their rights. Turkey, the same, 10,000 political prisoners and Turkey claims to be uh, a democratic country, but actually 10,000 Kurdish political prisoners, that's not little. How do you think people Iran can support? Iran is the same, of course. Yeah. How do you think people can support, um, just Iraqi people, Kurdish people? I think it's important not to fall into these divisions of religious um, sects and so on, and there are secular progressive forces in these regions and in these areas as well, and there are a lot of Kurdish people who want independence for Kurdistan and their rights, the, this legitimate right should be actually supported by the international community. Because in Iraq we have had genocide, you know, over 100,000 people, 180,000 people were subjected to genocide, whereby today we don't even have their uh, corpses, you know what I mean? And let alone the political imprisonment and, and violence. I lived under Saddam's regime, my family were all Peshmerga fighters, and so I witnessed some of or, or much of this uh, fascism that we were subjected to as Kurds. Uh, and that's not easy, really. And we never want that to repeat under Maliki government, for example. And I think that he's going to the same direction as well. It's another fascist, but in a different time. One last question. Uh, it's, it's, it's the British connection, where we know that the largest foreign fighters in ISIS are British, actually. And, uh, you know, they, they keep talking about how concerned they are about them coming back. No one talks about what they're doing there and how concerned they should be about that. I wonder if you think there are any links between the ISIS British jihadis and the rise of Sharia courts and the Burqa and things like that here in Britain. I think we cannot separate them from each other, but we cannot just relate one thing to ISIS. ISIS and all these veil and Islamic uh, movement all over the world, be it here in America, in France, in many countries around the world where they are setting up mosques, where they are setting up Sharia courts, where they are setting up religious schools for children. These are not isolated events or subjects. These are all part and parcel of a growing movement of political Islam 
whereby it doesn't have to have a certain political party or a certain country. They belong to a very big community internationally, and that's Islam and political Islam. For example, if you hear Abu Bakr Baghdadi's speech, uh, the head of ISIS, he makes it very clear that they have multinational fighters in their ranks, and they are calling for, uh, basically they are dreaming of controlling the entire planet with the, the Ummah and Islamic Jihad and all these dreams that they have from many years or, ago. Or nightmares. To conquer, really. exactly, yeah. it's nightmare yeah. in fact. Yeah. Uh, so imagine, they are working with such uh, determination that they want to conquer the world as if we are living in, I don't know, 1,400 years ago whereby you can just invade country and say this is an Islamic state or this Khalifa for this part of the world. It doesn't work like that, but unfortunately, uh, because the West has kept a blind eye for a very long time, especially in the UK, they kept a blind eye on the growing number of jihadists in this country, of the growing number of, of Islamic schools, children's schools, Sharia courts, mosques. Uh, we don't know what, go what is going in there. So this is, of course, it's all linked in my opinion. Well, I, I mean, I don't, just not to end on a negative note, the thing is that they, they might have that dream or nightmare, but there are people like you who uh, hopefully won't let that happen. So yeah. thank you, Hosan Mahmoud. Thank you so much, Mahir. Yeah. Thanks. I hope you enjoyed the interview with uh, Hozan Mahmoud. I think one of the characteristics which we've talked about a lot as well on the program is how the Islamists come and they attack women first as one, as one of their priorities. And we're seeing you know, the rise in rape, the rise in sexual jihad, the rise in um, restrictions on, on women's rights. And of course, just the, the, the general slaughter. What I find really interesting about this whole situation or or tragic really, is the fact that now the solution is being given as, as, you know, it's the US and the Islamic regime of Iran that can solve the situation. I mean, they're part of the problem, you know, it's just, it's amazing that people can just go back to those who've initiated in, in a lot the of problem, sense yeah. this problem I mean, it, as being a solution. Absolutely, I think all groups, all the states will try to sort of advance their interests in the situation and it's important uh, especially at this uh, uh, time, to emphasize that uh, the solution um, does not re should not rely and does not belong to ethnic and religious groups, including ethnic and religious states. What actually the solution is, we need to emphasize secular uh, state, uh, the right of citizenship everywhere, any solution that does not recognize that. The state must be secular, religious groups should be disarmed, all of them, they need to step aside, and citizenry needs to be promoted. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And that's what we're fighting for in Iraq and in Iran and the Middle East. And I mean, that's why the secular movement, I think, has got a lot to offer as a solution, I think, uh, in the same way that we have that in Britain as well, as well as in Iraq and in Iran. I think that's why, that, that's a key, uh, um, I think develop and that we need to push. For. You know, in a sense, when you look at the map that they keep showing on this crisis, we were talking about it earlier, where they've just divided up Iraq into Sunni and Shia and Kurd. And, you know, you think, well, what about people who are Sunnis who are married to Shias or married to Kurds? Or what about people who are atheists? Or what about people who don't even care whether they're Sunni or Shia or Kurd? You know, what, what's happened is they are dividing society. Imagine if that happens in Britain, for example. Where does where does where does the Scottish and the you know the um, I don't know the uh, Eng the English go versus the Scottish versus this? I mean, everybody has to start moving because societies are not homogeneous like that. Communities are not homogeneous. Yeah, in that, I mean, way. that was the whole thinking, the policy, uh, dividing people uh, according to ethnicities that or s sects, religious or religions, which. Uh, people deep down never identified themselves with, you know, this was only promoted uh, because of that sort of sick, I would call, sick mentality. And uh, talking about, you know, your previous question about the players in this, all those players now, like Iran, uh, USA, Syria, the Maliki... Uh, Saudi Arabia. Saudi, Saudi Arabia, Arabia, the yeah. Maliki government, you know, all these, these are part of the problem themselves. 
Um, the, uh, if you want to look at it politically, I think I Iran is one of the main losers, actually, the Islamic regime, because they had very good, the, uh, the Maliki regime was their way of entering into Iraqi politics. And, and, and the events show that the um, Maliki government cannot sustain itself. And with that, the Islamic regime will, will lose its foothold in, in Iraq. So um, uh, the USA, um, um, you know, saw that, you know. So this, uh, in the beginning, there was talk about the Islamic Republic, the Iranian regime and the Americans working together to suppress the, uh, you know, ISIS. But that's just a joke because uh, the, uh, for the Americans, actually, this is a good development in terms of isolating the Islamic Republic. So even the nuclear talks, which is another subject, uh, in, in that Iran would appear in a, on a weaker basis. So uh, the Islamic regime is not in a situation to have much influence in that. And if we want to really look for a solution, and as Hosan says as well in her interview, it is to look to the people. I know that people have suffered so much, you know, after so many years of wars and everything. But it's still the hope lies uh, in, the, in civil societies, civil movements, social movements, progressive left-wing you know, movements, which do, uh, Iraq contains actually, uh, to make a presence, a strong presence. And, and in Iraqi Kurdistan, that's another situation because there is a talk about separation, and Hosan talks about that, separation on, based on a referendum from Iraq. On a relative basis, I think that's a good development because it takes them out of that sort of scenario, you know, that, that sort of inferno that uh, the Iraq has been caught up in and allows for uh, some breathing space for the people over there. And I think that needs to be based on, I mean, we need to push for citizenship right, secular state rather ethnic or religious state. Can I just watch out for the uh, old anti-imperialist <sighs> pro religious left wing to suddenly jump out like an imp and defend Ayesh. They Watch have out. already. They okay. have. They have, have they? Okay. They're called freedom fighters. Exactly. I think mean, that, that's the thing. <sighs> that's that's the. So I think I think they they would do that. So they, it doesn't matter how horrible they are, they'll do that, and they need to be condemned. Oh, how we shameful, must honestly. we must defend the secular state. We must defend citizenry, and that's the solution to most of the problems in Middle East. We really need to go back to the idea of citizenship rights, universal rights, and universal values and norms, and, and stop segregating people by race, religion, ethnicity, and so on and so forth. The, um, you know, this uh, al-Baghdadi uh, said in his speech in Mosul, he said, I am your leader, no you're not, though I'm not the best of you, that's for sure, so if you see that I am right, support me, no thanks, and if you see that I'm wrong, advise me. Well, our advice to you is to F off to the Middle Ages where you belong and leave the 21st century to the rest of us and leave the people of Iraq and Syria alone. And now for this week's insane fatwa, which has been brought to us by Egyptian atheist Ben Bazaziz. It's now a fatwa from Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Saleh Al Fawzan, who's a member of the Council of Senior Scholars of Saudi Arabia, has issued a fatwa calling on the Saudi government to smash all cameras of visitors to the Kabe, or what's known as the Sacred House. He said some visitors are coming to do evil by taking photos and not to worship. And he says, if I see them photography, photo, uh, taking photographs beside Kaaba, Kaaba, and this is Haram, this is God's sacred house, the cameras should be taken and crushed. Clearly, even cameras are not safe from insane fatwas. We've now reached the end of our program. We would like to thank some of the 126 people who donated to our second fundraising campaign. They include John Bailey, Kian, who doesn't want to be mentioned, but instead would like to have the YouTube channel I Am God mentioned, as well as his cause for animal rights, Muriel Seltman, Sander Arts, and Stephen, who wants to mention his cause, I Have Choice.org, which supports young people from South Asia whose life choices have been taken out of their hands from their families and communities. And of course, there's also Tanya Smith, and she wants us to mention Fitna or Zana Azad. I hope you've enjoyed this week's program. On behalf of all three of us, we wish you a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time. Bye.